Hi, Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang. Uh, we're going to be joined by John Borthwick in a minute, but uh, already here and present are from the legs on sale capital of the world, Danny Sullivan. Hello. Hi, welcome. Thanks. Uh, from the uh, British Isles, uh, I don't know which one you're going to play on, on today's show, but uh, it's Keith Tier. Welcome, Keith. Hi, nice to see you all. Likewise. And uh, also from the British Isles, or is it the EU, or is it, uh, uh, what is it? Where are you from, Kevin? I'm from the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern ah. Ireland, but yes, <laughs> that's part of the European Union, so I get a Nobel Peace Prize too, it's great. That's uh, excellent. The, the Northern Ireland bit's always been wrong, Kevin. Well, um, hmm. <laughs> I got enough problems, I don't need another. Uh, <laughs> exactly. All right, let's see if we can get Borthwick in here. But uh, while we're waiting, uh, Danny Sullivan, uh, what's floating in your boat these days? Uh, I did a big post about how Microsoft is changing their privacy policy exactly the way Google did, but nobody's gotten all up in their face about it. Can you explain that? Because, you know, that was last month uh, or so. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, I can't remember last week. You, so. you might recall that Google announced that they were going to change their privacy policy so they could share things between, say, YouTube and Google Web Search, and they, you know, they could. If you used one service, what you were doing on one service potentially could be used on another service for them to target with you at with ads or to improve um, some of their products and services that they might do. So it was really just saying, you know, if you if you're on Google, whatever you do on Google can all be, you know, used against you in a court of law, kind of. And uh, everybody freaked out. I mean, the first day that that news came out, um, there were almost 50 different articles just looking at tech meme alone about it. And then over the course of four months, there were at least 20 additional news incidents that followed. Everything from the EU, which is almost ready to apparently declare this, you know, illegal under U EU law, and everyone in Florida must be stopped to the chair of the FTC saying that this was a brutal, um, air quotes, brutal choice for consumers that they were making this kind of switch. So it got a lot of attention, huge amount of attention. And I remember looking at it, for me as well, and I remember looking at it at one point and talking about whether people needed to be worried or not, and I was saying, well, it seems like Microsoft already has these sorts of things and nobody's freaked out about that. Um, and, and in one part of Microsoft's privacy policies, they do seem to allow it. but Last month, they announced that they were, well, announced is sort of a, a light term to use. Um, <coughs> last month, they um, started emailing people with Microsoft accounts saying that there was going to be a change to the service agreement and that the service agreement would allow for this kind of cross-sharing to happen as well. The email didn't really say it that clearly. And if you dig into the terms and services, you kind of get it. And if you have been paying attention to the important blog post that was placed out on the well-read Microsoft Volume Licensing blog, you might have discovered it. But for the most part, it, it came up in the news places that did spot it on a Friday afternoon through the weekend. And that's the only thing that only kind of coverage has been happening. There, there's been no significant fallout coverage. The day that it did kind of come out, there were maybe seven articles that were written. Uh, none of them were longer than about four paragraphs. And so I just kind of thought, well, either what Google did and all, all that attention for was, uh, was um, you know, with Google who made this change got all this attention for it. It's still facing, you know, EU scrutiny over it. Microsoft does the same thing, doesn't get the same attention. What what was not right or what, what's going on there? Um, and really, it just seems to be that, well, Google actually went out of its way to try to tell people it was making this change, and that blew up in its face. Didn't seem quite fair, but, you know. Anyway, that covered so, it. So what, what's driving it, Danny? Do you think it's... I, I've noticed uh, a lot of retargeted ads recently where, you know, I, I buy something and then for the next three weeks someone tries to sell me the thing I just bought because they're retargeting. And that obviously involves some kind of horizontal infrastructure across sites and devices. Do you think that they're just trying to get into that game or do you think something else is under underneath this? Um, sure, the retargeting and, and having better better ad abilities for Google was a big part of this. And, and in fact, they explicitly said that this is one reason. Like, for example, if you did a search on Google um, for skateboards and then you go over to YouTube, 
they want to be able to know that you just search for something on Google for wa- skateboards and therefore tell YouTube about it so that YouTube can both, you know, perhaps suggest some skateboard videos, some of which might even be, you know, ad placement types of things. So there's, there's no doubt they wanted to do it. And Microsoft, for its part, is like, oh, well, we're making this change, but we would never use your SkyDrive data or we'd never use your Hotmail data to... Um, target you with ads in the way that Google does. I mean, if we were going to do that, I'm sure we would tell you. <laughs> of course, they've granted themselves the right to do it, and, you know, so they could do it at any point. It, it's kind of like that, that law that got passed where the U.S. president can, you know, decide that they want to kill somebody because they're a terrorist, and Obama's like, well, I won't do it. <laughs> okay, well, whew, we don't need to worry about that law anymore. So the, the ads are definitely a big part of this sort of thing, and, and Microsoft actually ran ads against Google you know, saying this is this is why they're making this change, and you know we're not like that. <laughs> so it's like, well, you are like that because you've made the exact same kind of change to give yourself the same kinds of abilities, and um, and in fact, we don't even have an itemized list of what you are or are not doing with that data. So wow. it's interesting because uh, there's another development roughly in the same space. Before you switch, uh, before you switch uh, to that, Keith, welcome John Borthwick. Hey, hey guys, sorry I was a little bit late, I was rebooting. I'm just trying to follow and track what's going on, so I'll just listen. Okay, you were, I think you were Amiga, you were at DOS, and then you were at Windows (laughs) 4.1, and you're back. Okay, go ahead, Keith. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, Apple in uh, iOS 6, if you go to the general settings screen, and then about, there's a section called advertising at the bottom, and if you click on that, uh, there's an option that says limit ad tracking, um, and and uh, you've got to turn that on in order to get, not be tracked. And the default is that it's off, which means you are tracked. This is what Apple is replacing the UDID with. It, it's called a um, an advertiser identifier something or other. I can't remember the acronym. I think it's IAF or something like that. Um, and um, it feels as if this concept of tracking uh, and, and uh, uh, retargeting, uh, because it's driving higher CPMs on the desktop in particular, at a time when traffic's moving to mobile, which isn't being monetized, that this seems like the short-term fix to protect revenues whilst they figure out what goes on in mobile. And uh, you know, the other thing that happened this week is it was announced that PC shipments dropped by about 8% year over year which basically means browser usage is dropping and mobile is, is probably the winner there. So there's a lot of pressure on the advertising platforms to try to monetize at a greater rate than they were before, either by higher CPMs or CPCs, same thing I guess, um, or by figuring out mobile. So the other thing that happened this week is Facebook. Hey, you're, did, bu- you're uh, filibustering here. Go ahead, Kevin, what did you want to say? No, I was just I was showing off the, the Apple setting. The, the other thing that's that's just came out was that um, Reuters announced that the FTC is setting up an antitrust suit against Google, and three of the four commissioners believe they got a case there for them limiting other um, people selling travel services and and things like that. So there's another marker where you know this sort of campaign of, of against Google is is bearing some fruit there. Is that what you were going to say, Keith? No, I was going to say that Facebook launched a new ad unit on mobile this week. The one, uh, uh, the, the intern who uh, invented it got uh, championed on Tech Meme yesterday, uh, which is the uh, promote your own post, the one we talked about last week, is now live on mobile as well and is driving revenue for them. Of course, it's earnings season coming up in the next couple of weeks, so we're going to get to see how well they did on mobile pretty soon. In other words, uh, you're interested in mobile. We all are, aren't we? No, I'm not. Uh, John Borthwick, uh, did you have anything else to add to this litany of uh, of connections going back uh, ad nauseum through the last 43 Gilmore gangs? I'm sorry, Steve. You broke up at the beginning. You said what about the last 43? I just don't. I'm I'm trying to get away from Keith's uh, neatly tying things together in a in a nice. Uh, organized fashion. I'm, I'm looking for some anarchy and chaos. You, you're <laughs> looking for I some random walk. None, um, none of that well, in my I, own I am, I am, um, I'm out of touch on, on what happened in the last uh, 48 hours with well, what with is the last thing? I just changed my setting on my iPhone, so thank you, Keith, <laughs> um, for that. So, um, But 
I, I saw that stuff fly through my stream, but I hadn't had time to read it, so I'm just had a busy week. Um, I have something random for you. I got my, um, I got my node um, this week. Um, What's that? Uh, so, um, you want to guess? It looks Is like that that weird thing that lets you shoot video? Nope. I'll Google it. Um, no. So it is um, an event-driven I/O server-side JavaScript environment. It's like a kaleidoscope. It's an yes. event-driven <laughs> flashlight. <laughs> so what it is is a node. As I was kind of fascinated with it. It was a. It's a. You hold the mic up. It's a. Uh, it's a Kickstarter project, and it's one of those wonderful things that you get on Kickstarter, and you, you see it, and you think this is this looks really interesting, and then it doesn't show up for nine months, and it comes nine months later, and you're like, what was that again? Uh, so. Um, it is what it is. Is that they've been working on? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm obsessively interested in you know little devices that connect to the the phone and uh, and do uh, sort of read um, uh, data um, and uh, pick up environmental data. So there's an accelerometer in the middle, right? And so there's a little iPhone app, and I can see uh, sort of live the movement of the node, um, which is kind of weird and interesting. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it, but you know, so here's my here's iPhone app, and this is yes. the first X-rated Gilmore game. So, okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> well, that right? So, thanks, Steve. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you brought it up. Why? That's a big node you have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've got a bunch of white guys with what do you expect? Um, <laughs> Okay, so there's the a you know, there's, is that kind of like six degrees thing? There's, you know, this has two sensors. On the end, you can pull off these sensors, right? And so one sensor, which I have, is I have a light, uh, a light on this end, which can act as a flashlight. You can also control. And then the other end, I got the heat sensor. You can pull this thing off, and you can uh, put on other sensors. So it's just like they're trying to, you know, sort of like you know, take uh, all of the uh, telemetric data and. Sort of you know, place it into a device. I'm not sure what I'm going to use it for yet, but it's kind of interesting. So there, you asked for something random. You got something random. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, Danny Sullivan, do you have any reaction to this before we attempt to the one? node? Yes. Does this, does this factor into Google's uh, uh, resurfacing uh, from their tailspin of, uh, of doubt and confusion that they've been going through? Google's got to resurface. <laughs> have you have you not seen the headlines? Google's doing just fine. They, they seem are? to be smacking everybody around. Yeah. Uh, in what way? Uh, second most, ex most valuable technology company over Microsoft. They keep growing their Android market share. You know that's, they. That's they you know when you're not worried about public relations and you just want to go out there and just you know beat up and go for it. Yeah, they seem to be doing fine. So oh, you're, you're, oh, and you approve wait, of this Wait, wait what was that I just heard two weeks ago? Was that Apple CEO recommending that people should use Google's Maps rather than Apple's Maps? What? Yes, I believe that was the case. For a couple yeah, of I, weeks. I think Google's feeling pretty good right now. This sounds oh, like by the, the way, the antitrust the thing, the beauty of the antitrust thing, because I was reading through it, the whole point of how that got started, the main thing the stuff that you heard most about in Congress that fair search has been all over the place about was Google has been unfair with vertical search and we need to stop this. And this is it. And apparently, from what I read from the Reuters thing, that is not what they're going to get challenged over. They're going to get challenged over the ability for people to um, share their data from AdWords to maybe Bing so that you can do some better comparisons, which is a more complicated point and, and probably a more valid point. But the stuff that you've heard the most about in terms of Google and the antitrust thing, sounds like that's not going to happen. Keith? I was going to say that if I bought one of those note things, my wife would cut me off from having any allowance for the next three months. How much is your allowance? Uh, it depends how much of it I can hide. <laughs> uh, my allowance is uh, whatever I get times two. Because <laughs> all I have to do is buy a Tina one, and I'm, uh, you know, inured. Is that the correct word? Mm, you know, my wife doesn't like techie stuff, so I can't play that game. I, I, and she hates me buying her clothing or jewelry as well, so I'm stuffed. I, 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 I'm in, a, I'm in a bad place. Janae's ruining it for everyone. 
Yeah. Okay. So, uh, now that we've gotten past random and organized, what's Where, this show really about? My, yeah, my, many. my working title for this show is Grow a Pair. Grow does a that, pair. Does that send any uh, uh, shivers down your spine? So, who's been weak and lily livered this week? Who is it that you're referring to that should grow a pair? Uh, I'm just uh, I'm offering that up as a, I would like to hear about people that need to grow a pair. Uh, Paul, you know, Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan. Yeah, well, I I didn't like that debate at all. But you know I'm not allowed to talk about it. Obviously Obama needs to grow a pair, but I think he will. You do. Yeah. How come? You know the guy is. Um, you know, and I should disclose I am uh, spiritually of the left. Um, uh, Obama has completely disappointed people like me. On the other hand, he's way better than uh, Romney. Uh, but you can't help just really being angry with him for screwing up the healthcare thing, despite the fact that he made, made it improved. He didn't go as far as he should have done. So we're all real disappointed. And then he comes out on the first debate and... Um, you know, really sounds like he's disappointed with himself as well, which he probably should be, but that comes across and Romney sounds like he's full of himself and excited and American politics is so superficial that that gets you up in the opinion polls. And that's kind of disappointing as well. So the whole thing kind of sucks if you are a thoughtful, spiritual leftist. Yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> um yeah, I just I, when I get uh, worried, I remember how it felt the day after Nixon was reelected with a landslide. How did that feel? Describe not, not good. Yeah, uh, but you know that's speaking to your uh, uh, s snipe at the uh, electorate and the, their v vapidity and stupidity in general. And you know, I remember my my. I have a British experience. And by the way, all four of us today on the show, other than yourself, have a British background because, of course, Danny lived in Brighton for many years, and um, may or may not be familiar with the whole uh, Ted Heath, Harold Wilson, Margaret Thatcher. I'm I'm leaping a few people there, but you know, we all had the same disappointment with Harold Wilson, and it uh, it almost felt like a relief when Ted Heath came in, even though we hated him more because Wilson was such a disappointment. Um, I was on the set at uh, at the shoot of Tommy uh, in Brighton uh, in '74 when uh, you know the the baked beans thing with Tina Turner. So uh, I think I actually uh, win in this uh, British stakes. Britishization of. Uh, so uh, you know I, we're not supposed to talk about the campaign, but uh, you know I think Letterman has it right by saying that. Uh, that this has just been the most god awful, uh, long, uh, you know, election about nothing. It's like a Seinfeld episode. I mean, can't this yeah. thing be over? I mean, I, I'm a political junkie, and I and well, we're I just, almost there. I can't. I, are you sure? Well, yeah, because we're going to have an election, so it's gonna, it's. What you know? The sad thing isn't is it over? The sad thing is that all the time that led up to it wasn't actually spent with people having the kind of debates that we're waiting for now. You know? I, I find the debates interesting. And what I really would like to have it is that we had had debates on particular topics so that yeah. instead of you having, well, this is what's going to happen with health care. No, this is what's going to happen. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Okay, now we're off to Afghanistan. Is it if we had had these kinds of debates on major topics and only those topics and that the candidates actually yeah, that's rather like, than just a debate and drop the pre rehearsed soundbite or whatever actually had to stand up and defend themselves that would have been interesting well I mean first of all they're going to make absolutely positively sure that that doesn't happen <coughs> there's no way that any uh, uh, of the major parties would agree to that format in other well, words with real you know that discussion. you know but that's where we sit around and, you know, we're weak as an electorate and we're also weak as a media. We sit around and let the major parties decide what they want to do. The, the major networks that are be doing the debates can say, no, actually, we want to do it this way. 
and this is what we're going to get together. Yeah, that only happens on, on the uh, presidential Aaron debate Sorkin. speech together. I know it only happens, but that's one of the reasons why I think people like things like the newsroom, because we can go over there and see how things are supposed to work. But, you know, we get what we demand and we get what we accept. And Well, that's why we like entertainment is because it's, you know, somebody makes it look like it is actually not random and, and completely screwed up. But that yeah. doesn't mean that it isn't random and completely screwed up. Yeah. I mean, the, the successful politicians are the ones that figure out how to be able to snake their way through. And I think, actually, Obama's done a brilliant job of that so far. Uh, so I, I think and hope that he will be reelected just on that basis alone. Yeah, I think he'll be reelected as well. But then I don't think he's going to uh, make us all very excited in the period ahead. Getting yeah, out of that. I don't really yeah. want to be excited about this. I just want it to work. Go ahead, John. I, I was just going to uh, jump in and say, and I normally stay out as a Brit, I normally stay out of these political discussions, but it's just like it has been, so, this has taken so long, and, you know, there's barely a dialogue going on, right? We're trying to have, I mean, it's, uh, it's clear that there's a, there's a big conversation that is sort of kind of taking place around, you know, the role of government in our society, but it's not really taking place, uh, the conversation yeah. that is. And so, you know, I think that, you know, from the English system, there's a couple of things that I wish that uh, I wish existed here. Is first of all, is that if you could have a shorter time frame, um, you know, there's a very limited time frame in the UK um, between the announcement of a uh, general election and between the general election. And I just think this, you know, this two-year window is crazy, and where you have people like Romney who have been running for, you know, in essence, uh, they've made a career of running for office. Um, the second thing is is that you know the, the super PACs and the, it's the amount of money that's been poured into this uh, this cycle. I mean, I'm uh, my political inclination is, uh, and I hope that uh, Obama is is reelected. I hate the fact that he's snaking his way through this. I wish he was actually uh, leading his way through it. I also wish that um, uh, you know post this this election we can be done with the super PACs uh, because I think that's been incredibly corrosive to the debate um, or any attempt to have a debate and then I you know I agree with Danny I mean I think that you know in, in England we have the question time uh, you know, sort of culture uh, which I think is a useful format to have sort of vigorous debates um, you know it, it's I've always found it weird because it's like you know we English are always accused of being more restrained and yet, in the political sphere, it's like if politicians get too tough um, on each other here, it's considered to be um, uh, it, it's considered to be not okay. I mean, I think that having sort of uh, you know very uh, my understanding is the American system all the way back to the founding fathers had you know have had has been one where there's been a lot of tough uh, arguments and debates, and that that well, is, I mean, I thought that that's part of the system, and yet we're trying to you know we try to sort of package these things all as media media events now. And make them soft on the edges when they shouldn't be. They should be real discussions that people are having about issues that they have real differences, and that we as an electorate can understand what we're going to do about them. Well, I don't think, know that there's any connection between understanding what the issues are and doing anything about it. But uh, I thought Biden did a great job last night uh, of just you know ripping uh, the uh, Romney campaign's uh, you know you know whatever that is. Uh, apart, and you know the fact is, is that that's what uh, vice presidents are supposed to do: is to go out and uh, and just you know rattle the cage, so that you know the president doesn't have to get his his uh, hands dirty until next Tuesday. Yeah. So I think it's the, I think the debates are working great. I, I agree with Danny, which is you know, you know the only problem with that is is that unfortunately. It took uh, 40 of those debates in order to get uh, the one Republican candidate lined up. To, yeah, to last night. I thought the moderator last night was very good. Yes. And I thought that uh, the moderator in the first debate was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, you know, he looked like he had, uh, he had mistakenly taken a different medication. <laughs> But the, uh, you know, the underlying thing that John referred to, which is um, the debate about the role of government, there really isn't a debate because uh, nobody can really stand up and defend um, the collective as a, a, as a form of organization, which is what government really should be as a, as a requirement for civilization. 
you know, if you think about roads or all the things governments should be doing for the collective, for all of us, none of that is understood to be an element of civilization. It's all, even, even those who want to defend the role of government are so defensive that they feel the need to uh, excuse themselves of spending money on anything that we all benefit from, healthcare being the best example, mm -hmm. education being another example. And, you know, we as a civilization um, measure our progress through how much of the necessities of life we can give people because of uh, our collective taxpaying. That should be a measure of civilization, a measure of progress, rather than something to be ashamed about. And I don't think the Democrats can really do that because they all are almost ashamed themselves, partly because they waste so much money doing stupid things. Like what? Like uh, all of the, all of the, uh, you know, when they pass laws that say that they'll pass law X if a million dollars goes to their own, um, their own local place. What's it called? The, I forget what it's called in America where you add things onto a bill uh, for your self-serving needs and then you vote for the bill because they allowed you to get your self-serving stuff on there. But, uh, I, I think that you're... Well, I don't know if you, but this conversation is arguing two sides of the same point, which is, uh, it, you know, this should be more real. It should be more substantive. It should be about what's actually going on here. And on the other hand, all of these, you know, riders that are attached and, uh, you know, the kind of ugly sausage making that is politics uh, is somehow shouldn't be going on. I mean, I don't care what they had to do, uh, honestly, including bankrupt the government. Uh, to get pre-existing conditions covered in this country. It's an absolute crime that, uh, you know, one of the more advanced countries in the world from an economic perspective, uh, that would be the best that we could say about us, uh, has, you know, kept that off the, uh, the burner. I mean, there are people who on a regular basis get sick and they, their entire family gets sick and goes away as a result of, of this horrendous stranglehold uh, that's been going on in the uh, uh, in the government so yeah. you know yeah. if we need to have uh, some pork thrown around liberally and people bought off in great numbers in order to be able to get something uh, real passed then so be it as far as I'm concerned yeah but it undermines the authority of government when what that authority that of government well, precisely, because they've worn it all away. Right. You know, that's like <laughs> saying, you know, as a parent, you know, I, I've lost all authority and respect on the part of my, my child. On the other hand, she's still my child, and she's going to have to suck it up. You know, I mean, we, I'm going to have to suck it up. We all have to do what our job is. So, you know, to say that, that the authority of the government has been undermined is like saying that the authority of Google is undermined by their reprehensible acts in terms of uh, just doing what they damn please because they can. Yeah, but that's, if it, you know, there's actually a really huge point there, though, because government, if you really think about it, is meant to be we. It's not meant to be them. And, and as soon as it becomes them and they do stuff which makes us pissed off, they undermine not just themselves as individuals, but the very institutions they're part well, of. We, we have a representative democracy. We, it, we don't go out, uh, you know, the electoral college decides who's president, not the popular vote. There's but a reason for that. But we still use the phrase, we the people. It, it's we the people, or in, in law, it's the people versus the criminal. It's not... The people you know, are played by, you know, the electoral college. I mean, I, there has to be some object objectification of who we represents it's yeah, just think, inevitable the yeah, metaphors well, are associated with uh, all of these uh, issues uh, yeah we i can't think, talk directly to uh 10 people let alone uh what is it a billion people in this country now no but i'm not talking technically uh i'm talking um you know what it, if you look at this the history of government Go government, um, uh, of course, isn't the demos, uh, uh, or, you know, the Greek demos. It, it isn't direct, although arguably some of the technologies we're building make the future um, a, a place where that possibly could become more okay, true. Okay, well, people are now desperately uh, attempting to make a, a pivot to actually 
technology, <laughs> so I'll use that one. Uh, there's been abs there's been almost no second screen activity associated with uh, with what's going on in terms of uh, of the campaign. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's a flare up of uh, if you were on Twitter last night, Biden won because he had two to one in terms of uh, of tweets, but other than that. What happened to real time, John Borthwick? What happened to uh, these technologies that we're all building? Yeah, I was. I'm kind of amazed at just how superficial the, you know, it, it's it, the talking heads on air are happy to talk about. You know, there was ten thousand tweets per second, or uh, or ten million, or whatever it was, some random number, which is just sort of a meaningless. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's meant to represent velocity, but it doesn't actually say anything, right? And so, I think it's. Um, I, I've been fascinated by the fact that the the campaigns I I had expected the campaigns this time. I mean, last uh, four years ago, Obama's campaign certainly led in terms of using social uh, media, using real time, um, but primarily as a sort of outreach and marketing tool. Um, so it really wasn't as a communications tool or as a two way tool. It was really to you know to mobilize and uh, uh, the their base and to and to reach people. This time I was expecting a, a, to sort of turn into, you know, more of a feedback loop. Um, it, it hasn't really happened. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I was talking with uh, the chief scientist over at Social Flow about this, Gilad. Um, he's done a bunch of research, which is on the Social Flow blog and in other places. But he was, you know, he was explaining how, you know, the Romney campaign, um, have been you know, they they use a few of the social tools, but they're not really that active, um, and they're not they're using them in very crude forms. Um, and he was talking about how some of the um, uh, some of the candidates have, uh, or people. It's unclear whether it's the candidates are buying followers or somebody's buying it for them, right? Maybe it's the super PACs who are buying followers for the candidates. But there's been sort of really interesting uh, spikes and uh, and then big losses of follower bases amongst the candid, uh, candidates themselves on on Twitter. And that's pretty interesting. The other thing is, as I was amazed last night during the debate, you know, talk about real time, Steve. I mean, I was sitting there um, and with my wife, and uh, she wanted to see what was going on on Twitter, and she's not a big Twitter user. And so she went over to um, uh, to Twitter, and uh, the unauthenticated page on Twitter was, you know, had nothing to do with the debates. And I just sort of watched her try to find something about the debates on Twitter as a sort of non active user. And it, it's, uh, it was. It, it's it's amazing how the fact that we still haven't figured out how to make uh, this amazing uh, sort of asymmetrical interest graph accessible to people to be able to just jump in because they actually want to right and I think that it's just it's it's still incredibly uh, kludgy and hard you know what's the entry point you don't have many followers you go to Twitter search. It's really, you know, on Twitter search, it's just really hard to see and decipher and sort of prioritize the searches. And then there's, you know, there's the preferred searches, which are up top, so those are ranked differently. And that's confusing. It's just... Well, it's but this is, this is this says more about, uh, you know, Twitter and uh, their uh, ineptitude in killing off all their third-party developers, while at the same time uh, not knowing how to be able to do it themselves. I think that Facebook too. I mean, it wasn't. You know, I I didn't spend a lot of time on Facebook last night. But I mean, I was on Twitter, but I was on my own uh, stream. And that's you know, if you've got a curated stream, I think it's you know, it's we know how amazing it can be. But it's that entry point. And I think also for Facebook and for the other platforms. I mean, I think the real time is still. Uh, you know, we're just uh, we're still trying to figure it out. It's it's it hasn't broken through this election season. The candidates are not using it in a meaningful way. The press is still using it as mostly for marketing and branding purposes. And I think it's still um, it, it's still like another universe. Like in the last debate, in the Obama debate, the Big Bird thing was you know sort of evolved as a meme, but it evolved Did as a meme in ad? another universe that then took maybe you know 24 hours to come back into the broadcast universe did right? you see the ad uh, uh, that a Democrat it looked like a real democratic ad uh, that uh, went after the uh, big bird did anybody see this yeah what did you think of that Danny I mean I was first of all I thought it was really funny Can you I, I, I didn't watch it? the whole thing I, I saw the Daily Show kind of poking fun at it and I sort of thought 
you know, eh, John Stewart was going on and on about it. Like, you really, you're still on Big Bird? Let it go. And it was like Big Bird every, 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 everything. And it's like, yeah, okay. You know, I don't know that that was necessarily the best of the ads you had to be running, but. Well, I, I, I thought it was funny. I just thought I, I, I couldn't tell whether it was a Saturday Night li- ad, uh, Live ad. I literally, I was, you know, I never watch TV anymore. I watch the computer. And occasionally I hear something and I look up. So I heard this. I assumed that this was a satire. I looked up and then it said, you know, Obama says that he approves this message. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, yeah. I think that's a really, I mean, can you remember a funny ad uh, in a presidential campaign, particularly one that's coming after a, a, a terrible debate performance where they you know what i i don't even want the ads i just want them to tell me what they're going to be doing yeah and you know i i I contributed to the obama campaign the uh first time that went around my phone keeps ringing they keep wanting to get donations i'm like you know i'm for them I'm more Democrat than I'm Republican, although I'm just more common sense in getting stuff done than anything else. And the, the reason I tend to be more Democrat in this election than Republican is simply because I feel like we're in this mess because of Republicans more than anything else. I, I'm really not ready to just give up on the Democrats after four years of trying to solve what eight years created. So, you know, I, that's where I'm at. But I'm thinking Obama's earned almost a billion dollars and Romney's got how much more money? And I just don't, I just don't, I think to me, it's just like a waste of money. There's got to be better things that we can do with our money than be blowing it all away on these election ads. And I also kind of felt like, no, you don't need any more money from me. What you actually need to do is go out there and explain what the hell you've done over the past four years. Because you've done some good stuff. And in fact, Bill Clinton did an excellent job of explaining them. It's a pity that the Obama administration can't actually say that. Or Obama himself do it. Well, which would you rather have? Which, would you rather have him? The chance of doing that. You know, you come back to it. It's like, well, the campaigns will never agree to having more debates. Why not? Why not have the campaigns agree that, actually, we're not going to run political ads? Instead of blowing all this money that people have better things to spend on, we're going to agree to 30 different debates on 30 different topics, and we're going to get all the airtime that we want. Because I think one thing is the debates have shown is that people will tune in. People will watch. People do want to hear things. So, you know. Mr. Sullivan goes to Washington. Yeah. And, that, and, and, you know, the, the, what they do, uh, uh, and, and I, I, I've been away from England for, uh, for a while, so this could be wrong now, but what they used to do, and I think they still do, is uh, political advertising is banned. As soon as the campaign is called, it's illegal to actually advertise politically. But every single channel is obligated in a public service way to give a certain amount of time in a balanced way to, to all the points of view represented. And that sometimes is more than two points of view. If there's a third party or if the fourth party, um, uh, they have to do that. So from a from a money spent point of view, probably it's worth the same amount that is spent here in America pro rata, but they don't actually have to pay for it, so it isn't a waste of money. And right. and, and that seems a smarter way to do the whole thing because it's both balanced and accessible, and it and it, it involves actual conversation, not just advertising. The, the difficulty is that you know. We have a First Amendment, and that prevents us from saying what people can or can't say. We, we're not going to have a law that gets passed that's going to ban political ads. You know, and it, it just isn't going to happen. But the campaigns themselves can agree to certain things. And that's one of the things that I think you'd want the campaign to be doing. I mean, it's not going to make change anything in this, this current election. That, you know, we're, 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 we're at where we're at, so... But going back to John's point about um, you know the uh, the stream and um, it, it, uh, and how inaccessible it is, what's the entry point? I thought that was a great point, and and it it's a very it makes you really think. I mean, if you think about real life, you know, let's say you're at a party and don't know anybody. The hardest thing to do is to go and walk up to a group and butt in and become part of their conversation, and usually. Uh, human beings respond well when there's a moderator, when somebody says, oh, come and join us. And it feels like there's no, there's no easy on-ramp uh, when it comes to news or substantial uh, content. There's no easy on-ramp for a person to get involved. And the existence of the data isn't sufficient. 
it's really the packaging of the engagement that's missing. And I, right. and I, don't, I don't know what that can be, but, but, but um, it feels like it needs a leader, if you like, or a curator that doubles as a moderator. I, I think you're uh, underestimating the uh, uh, ability on the part of uh, at least one party uh, to uh, uh, attack the moderator as the problem. You know, if you have a leader, it, it may be more organized, but it's also less likely to produce the kind of you know learning that needs to go on uh, in the conversation. Because, you know, I mean, like, the thing that I try and do, uh, you know, with th this show is to stay the hell out of the way as much as possible. It doesn't mean that I don't get to, you know, wax uh, boringly at, at nauseam about what my issues are. It just means that I try and sort of set the tone that there is no moderator. There's no, I mean, I'm not moderating what you say. I can interrupt you, but that you'll just, you know... I have an expression on your face, which I will think be though, devastating. Steve, yeah, but we could, there's, a, there's a point. Can I jump in? Yeah, no, uh, no, because I'm not yeah. the moderator. Please, you moderate. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think that there's an important point here, which is or something uh, that I think about is, you know, those uh, those a whole bunch of studies which were done, sort of looking at small groups of people, um, and uh, you know, giving them simple problems, simple tasks to complete, um, and using a network-based structure where there's essentially no leadership, and that they have to figure out the solution, versus um, a you know a leader, um, and uh, and then getting them to figure out the same solution, and so the. Uh, what what they concluded was that for in general um, is that for you know complicated problems is the network based structures uh, come up with far more uh, sophisticated and better solutions to problems um, they take longer um, but for simple decisions uh, network structures become very confused and sort of take a long time and argue amongst themselves and that the uh, sort of a, a hierarchy slash a leader model works better for simple decisions decision making. So, so how do you I think that simple? what we have is that, you know, as you think about the network now and this dynamically organized network and clustering of data and information that exists in the real time stream and how it's, you know, sort of, it's constantly sort of reclustering itself, reforming itself and, and as opinion changes and as Big Bird moves to, you know, discussion of Ohio or discussion of Romney or discussion or whatever. Um, I think that you know, Keith's point of trying to figure out how we can combine that sort of complex network structure with sort of uh, with a combination of decision-making structures, so that we can actually get you know get stuff done and use all of this data, so we can drive it towards action. And we're talking about govern government now, but I think this applies just as much for you know for uh, individuals and for brands and for people who are trying to like talk to other people using these mediums. But I think to stick with government, you know, yesterday I was at a great conference um, here in Brooklyn. There's an event going on um, by one of our partners um, called Brooklyn Beta, which is a three-day uh, designer developer conference in Brooklyn. That's a great. It's an October event, and it's really become, I think, a fixture here in, in New York and in Brooklyn. Um, they had Cory Booker, who's the mayor of uh, Newark, who opened up yesterday, and I was there listening to him. And Cory Booker's um, a pretty amazing mayor in a lot of ways, but one of the things is the guy's, you know, he's figured out how to, he basically speaks in hashtags. I mean, he's 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 got this incredible knack of condensing everything down to, you know, going through these complex uh, issues uh, that our society and government faces, and then reducing them down to these hashtags, which is very powerful because then they can be shared. The problem is, is that it's sort of like too long didn't read. It's like too complex. Don't think about it, right? And so we don't have a space to actually think through them. So we're just taking these very complex ideas, moving them through the network. But we need to deconstruct them and actually get them into those small groups and actually consider our options and make decisions around them. Because I think that the, the network structure is a far more efficient decision-making structure for what we face today, which is a complex world. But I think that we need to balance it with some, uh, with some of the simpler uh, decision-making structures. Um, that involve hierarchy and that we've used for hundreds if not thousands of years. And I think with today we just got like by brute force, we got this broadcast structure over here. And 
it is an adapting to the network structure. It's just like banging up against the network structure and they can't speak to one another. Does this make any sense to anyone? No, it totally. Uh, you know, I, I was experimenting. With, I don't know if I ever talked to you about my now.tv idea, but it was, it was saying, look, in a, world, in a world where there's Skype, Twitter, and, uh, uh, and live stream or Ustream, couldn't we come up with a way of presenting news and engaging people mm. that, is, that, 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 that uh, has all the professionalism of broadcast well. news, but with none of the one-dimensionality? Uh, uh, and uh, I never really answered that question. I, I'm a bit too busy to think any more about it, but uh, it's still the question, I think. Well, let me reframe this in just a slightly different way, which is uh, I was thinking about this the other day. I don't know who I was talking with about it, but uh, somehow Steve Jobs uh, and Apple seem to get themselves into a room where they actually do have these kinds of discussions yeah. at a very deep level about the design and the goals and the motivations of the users and the all sort, you know, and obviously the economics. I think that's probably uh, one of the bigger components of that. How do they pull that off? And, well, I think that, and I want to, you know, and I want to address I mean, this I, when often when speaking to small companies, Steve, I use the analogy that I used of the simple decision making structure versus the complex, because I think that you've got to build into as you start up a company, right? The, 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 the beginning is one of those complex structures where you've just got to, you've got to be in a very loose form and you want minimal amount of hierarchy and you want to be able to maximize the amount of edge based innovation and you're essentially creating a small network. But then over time, as you begin to get sort of product market fit and you define your product, you need to re you know, restructure that into more of a hierarchy so you can actually produce product and ship great product. But in a highly successful organization like mm -hmm. Apple, I think that they've, decision they've, they've figured out how to run those two things simultaneously. And so that they have both a very efficient sort of factory-like you know, mechanism which is running over here, and then they have over to the right of it, they have a, uh, an in innovation stream that uh, continues to run and that is very net network-based. And, um, uh, and I think that that's, that is, you know, that's what companies need to aspire to doing today because you know, the former model where you just you, know, you create at the beginning but you create the production line and then you go with the production line, I think that that's kind of like the, you know, we've seen you know, the yachts of the world and others have tried that. And you, you just, as the innovation cycle or the primary curve that you're riding begins to cap out, you just hit a wall because you don't have any innovation mechanism left inside of your company. Um, and so I think that, you know, I agree with Danny that Google's on a tear right now. If you want to look at stock price and earnings, um, I do, you know, where will Google be in five years? Uh, you know, I think that they, they're just at that point where they're, I think that their search business, they've got to figure out how much of that can they take and move into these other businesses. And that's what they're doing with Plus and others. And it's, uh, you know, it's still to be determined how successful they'll be in that. But, uh, Danny, what does, do you think? You know, is Google got an innovation engine and that network-based structure that Apple has? I, I haven't seen that yet. And so I think that's very hard to build. And few people have done it. Danny, uh, uh, and then uh, I need to get to Keith because he has a hard stop in a couple of minutes. You mean in terms of the innovation within the structure? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I posited this uh, Apple kind of uh, scenario that seems to be very efficient at getting to deeper uh, insights and, you know, in a collaborative environment. Uh, is Google doing the same thing? I mean, they're on a tear, as you said before. Well, it's hard for me to tell how much Apple's been doing that because it was collaborative and how much of it was because Steve Jobs seemed to have a real visionary idea of where they were going to go. I mean, he in particular seemed to come up with this idea that we can create products that will in turn, you know, nobody's, nobody's expecting. We're going to have a phone that's playing music and that's going to be a different kind of phone in a way that nobody's used to expect having that sort of out there. Yeah, but I think We're he, gonna, he learned that from, uh, you know, the Stones and the Beatles and uh, well, I mean, however you know, the, he learned the music it, he, that he really liked. He, he learned the idea that you could invent your own universe uh, and that you could, some people can be successful at it. Yeah, but, he, but that's not peculiar well, what I'm, to what him. What I'm saying is he's he's it, it might not be peculiar. Well, I don't know that. I mean, we you know, we've uh, seen that's Apple the bring debate. out these. Uh, right, I haven't heard. So we, we well, I don't know. That so that's my answer is in terms of. But that was not to answer whether or not whether to answer whether or not Google has it. First of all, I have to say, I don't know how much Apple has it as opposed to Apple had it because of Steve Jobs. Right. I, I literally don't Great know. Great question. You, you know, um, still uh, see, you know we're, 
we have um, to see. Last night I listened to the Cringely thing, you know, the, the Lost interview with Jobs. It's, yeah, what's it's it like? A, it's a fabulous interview on this particular point. He, he talks about why IBM uh, crested and why Microsoft crested. It was a 1995 interview. And, why, uh, and, and he, he puts forward the idea that um, companies typically reach a point at which they no longer protect the product people from the people who say no. And he made the point that product people uh, should and always are coming up with things that people say no to. And, and that's because they're pushing the envelope and they're in a world, uh, a future world that doesn't exist yet. So the natural instinct of a business person, a salesperson, a marketing person is to say no. And he made the point that at Apple, they protect the product people from the no people. They let the no people get on with selling and marketing and they leave the product people to decide what comes next and they don't mix the two. Uh, and that, that seemed to me a, a pretty crucial insight. And then he said, within the product people, he gave this analogy of uh, uh, one night, he put some rocks in a tin can on a machine that turned the tin can round and round. And the next morning, he opened the can and the stones were all shiny. And he said, you know, that's product development. You put people that are, have friction in a room and they're all smart. They like each other because they're all smart. Uh, they don't all agree, but at the end, something shiny comes out because they're empowered to create the future. Okay, so that, that sounds like something that is not Steve Jobs. It is something that survives St Steve Jobs. Now, yes. Are we seeing that at Google, which is what I asked? That uh, I think, Danny, you didn't answer that question. I, I don't know on Google as well. I mean... You, if you want to see that sort of thing at Google, I think you have to look at the stuff you can't buy as a consumer, in particular Google Glass, the smart glasses, and the auto-driving cars. Okay, these are things that are just out of nowhere at Google. I mean, no, the, the, no one's anticipating that. Nobody's doing stuff with that. The the auto-driving car thing. I mean, when I was at TED two years ago. They, they, the first demo, they had a whole section on where cars might be going, and one thing was um, somebody talking about how they helped a blind person drive, and they showed him on a closed track, and they're giving him all this feedback, and they're throwing and he manages to turn it because he's going 30 miles per hour, and, and, and we have ways to go, and then the Google demo comes, and then you're like, oh my... <laughs> All this other stuff is just left behind. How advanced those cars are and where they're likely to go. Yeah, but I, I, I would argue that uh, the Gmail uh, is profoundly disruptive and uh, is one of the most important things that's ever happened. It, it was. basically created uh, the, the, you know, a proof point for what seemed impossible prior to that, which is the cloud. It, it was, and it, it, it's one of those things that shifted that oh. Hello. Um you know, in terms of other things that Google have, has done that's radically shifted the way people... And if you're talking about stuff that came right out of Google's own structure itself, it gets harder if you look over the past few years. Um, you know, I think that they're probably doing some incredibly innovative stuff in terms of how the ad display networks operate and in terms of how they can go out in real time and figure out who wants to bid on what kind of ad, not touch just search, but in display, but that's not a consumer thing that you notice much and that, that you know, you're going to go out and buy. But you look at Android, it's difficult to look at Android and go, wow, they really upturned the way things work there. I don't agree with they just copied everything the iPhone did, but they certainly had the ability to ride on what the iPhone helped bring into the greater consumer space. Sergey um, Sergey seems to own that space at Google, which is you know just go off and do interesting stuff. But yeah. Ser but Sergey is not a product guy. Ser Sergey is really an engineer with a, with with, with a, uh, an inspired you know resourced engineer. So his stuff is interesting. The glasses, the self-driving car, they're all interesting, but none of them feel like a product yet. Well, no, the glasses feel very much like a product. I mean, the Eventually, maybe. I, maybe, but I mean, the glasses, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens when they come out with these developer types of things. I had a brief chance to play with one of them, and the ability to just tell it to take pictures... And and to pull up some information the way that it could, it was kind of impressive. I mean, I think the challenge with the glasses is <sighs> right on them. 
you know, do you get some developers to start off with, but do you really get them down into a price tag to say I can afford what is that noise? Uh, it's I, it's noise. John Borthwick. Uh, it's room noise uh, in John's area. Uh, all right, let's. Uh, we're gonna have to wrap this up. I would just make one quick comment about. Can uh, I comment on the Apple? What? I talk about the Apple versus Google thing. Yeah, I'm the one who's worked for both. Of them. Yeah, I just want to. Um, I just want to so let Keith go. So the Apple go. one was very much built with Hang on. isolation between the elements. Okay, I, just let me let Keith go because he said he had to go. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, and uh, great to see you all. Likewise. Okay, Bye. and uh, everybody else stay, at least for a few minutes. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay, so the, the way Apple was set up was um, there were all these product groups that were doing stuff in isolation, but they then had to do have a beauty contest for Steve for them to go out into real production. So there were, there were lots of things going on in parallel and lots of isolation between the teams, you know, sort of lack of communication. Google was set up very differently because they they come they were more built from the, in some ways, the open source culture where everything's going on in parallel and in public. And within Google, everything is visible to everyone else inside Google. So if you want to go and change something, you don't start your own development effort. You go and find the thing that's there and modify it and, and try and work with them. Now, that has I think that has changed a bit since um, Larry took over again. And there's, there's more of a... Uh, CEO picking win winners model going on at Google, but I'm not sure it's. Um, I, I, haven't, you know, I, haven't, I haven't been there since that ha that happened, so I don't know how much the culture has changed. But I get a sense that 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 freewheeling sense of openness that was there, and that actually maps to the open source world and the things going in parallel that John was talking about, has um, been muted quite a bit now, and there is more of this um, strategic thing going on, and that yeah, that stuff has moved over to Google X, where Sergey is. What what I don't see happening at Google, and maybe Danny, you can correct me on this, uh, I don't see a disruptive attitude about business. I see a disruptive attitude about technology, but I don't see the kinds of uh, attention to detail, uh, you know, the wrangling of, you know, large business interests like carriers or the music companies or whatever that Apple has done consistently to the you know, the other side of the of of the equation, I don't see anybody, maybe with the exception of Bezos, have a, a paying attention to this kind of stuff. I mean, you just, well, you know, agreed. Although I think that Apple's also had issues where you've had the same kinds of companies that they disrupted and then partnered up with Apple, then turn around and say, actually, we don't know if we want to do this. We don't know if we want to allow that. We think you're too powerful. So I, I don't know that the disruption is completely over, nor that Apple has a lock on it. I think that, um, you know, agreed that Amazon has been very sort of nimble in that kind of space and seems to keep pace with them. Um, Google really has been limited by its ability to do much because they've just been viewed as a big piracy monster. Which is why when they rolled out this pirate update or this DMCA thing where you know they agreed that they would penalize sites if they had a lot of DMCA complaints against them, that was a really big issue. And I, if I recall, it was like a week or two ago that Google finally signed a deal with someone else. And I think you're going to see more of that. I mean, that's Google basically caving in with the whole, we well, can't control what happens on the web. The web just does what it wants and saying, okay, we can control it if that's what you need for us to be able to make deals. Um, but I think Hollywood's still got a huge amount of disruption that's yet to take place. Yeah, excuse I'm, me, take place. So I'm not trying to sell the idea that Apple is uh, the be all and end all of this. I'm, what I am suggesting, however, is that uh, we don't see a lot of it of what Apple uh, has in their secret sauce uh, materializing elsewhere. John Borthwick, would you agree or or not? Yeah. So I I just it's not. Skype started working again, so hopefully, if I break up, tell me. I mean, I think that it's uh, I think Apple's rare. I think that there's, you know, I've I've seen up close a, a couple of big companies, AOL and Time Warner, sort of go through big disruptive cycles, and it's it's really hard for for companies. Uh, it's just hard for large organizations and people to figure out how to navigate this. And, and I think that Amazon, which I heard half of what I think um, Kevin was saying on Amazon or Danny was saying, um, I don't think that they've been through. I think the Bezos is 
I, I, I agree with what Keith said early on, is that having product leadership and also having sort of founding CEO at the helm of these companies, I think, is, is, a, is hugely important. And that that's one characteristic that I think you see through the ones who make it through um, these, um, uh, these cycles. Um, but I think that Amazon is yet to sort of hit a truly disruptive uh, cycle in its business, I think its core business. You know, if we were, if we would suddenly see the rise of sort of P2P commerce, um, you know, of people using sort of non-currency-based systems and sharing stuff and doing stuff and loaning stuff instead of buying stuff, that would be, I think, hugely disruptive to Amazon's, you know, uh, marketplace. And I'm not sure that they would, uh, you know, be able to navigate through that. However, one managed a company they are. Um, I think that Apple is. Uh, so I think that Apple's, you know, they figured some stuff out. We've got, yeah, we got to see whether it lasts beyond Steve Jobs and, um, and whether what Apple's figured out isn't just a sort of one piece of a cycle, whether it's actually a sustainable system that they've institutionalized in the company in some form. Um, because you know, I remember, I mean, there's this, you know, the seminal book on this stuff, a guy called Clay Christensen, uh, wrote the, dis the Innovator's Dilemma, and I remember, you know, years back, being at AOL, and um, you know, after the uh, AOL Time Warner merger, they pulled together these, the, this, a group of us, this, of, of people at AOL, and you know, about 50 of us, we did this Harvard Business School offsite for a day or two days, and Clay Christensen came and led a discussion, and, um, you know, the, um, the, the topic was uh, sort of disruption, and, you know, the case that was made was that AOL was a disruptor in its nature, and it could not be, therefore, be disrupted, right? It's sort of is a very meta argument. You can't disrupt the disruptor. Um, well, it turns out that you can disrupt the disruptor, and all companies, you know, that have built sort of you know big, uh, you know, big new businesses and you know through technological shifts are disruptors by their nature. But then they become the incumbent, and when the whole world changed, you know, and broadband, the broadband shift took place. I think that you know, it will. Um, you know, had a hugely difficult time navigating that and, and failed to get to the other side of it. And so I think it's, uh, it is very hard. And I agree, with, I agree with Danny's point that I think Hollywood is, you know, we've only seen a fragment of what's coming um, in terms of um, the disruption for Hollywood. All right. So uh, just once around the table, uh, I think Danny mentioned this, uh, the idea that these people uh, are living in the future. You know, a, a product groups. Maybe it was you, John. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, it was probably. I, I said nothing so insightful as that. <laughs> but you did hear it and can comment on it. Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, let's uh, imagine that we're all living in the future. Uh, we're trying to figure out what. In, instead of trying to figure out what we want to do next, let's figure out what we would like to see next. Whether we do it or others do it. I'll start with anybody who wants to say anything. Maybe Kevin. Well, I think yeah. P partly the the yeah the product guys can live in the future because they've got funds to build things that are not actually commercially viable yet. But and that's not, definitely what Sergey's doing, and it's kind of what Apple does, but does it with much more secrecy. But you're a product um, guy now. The difference so what do you is you that want to do? these disruptive network-based things are happen are changing faster than that. Um, and the sort of the we can predict the future because we can throw money at it and do things that, that aren't viable for, for, for five years is no longer true because these disruptions are coming faster and because they're, they're coming out of software um, rather than out of hardware and, and manufacturing. And that, that's the thing that's, that makes it harder and harder to see where, where stuff's coming from. Okay, but uh, um, you're, you're now in this product group. I'm not asking you to, to uh, what do you want to see happen if it's not five years, maybe it's two years or one year now. What is it that you think um, will be interesting to see? What What's next that's going to uh, appeal to you as both a consumer and a, uh, a developer, etc.? What what, where does your mind go in this? The, the, the stuff... Th the stuff that we use all the time becoming completely pervasive and actual the rest of you know, business and politics getting their head around the thing that's changed that we've seen happen to media um, and to tech to some extent where all this stuff is going on in parallel all the time um, and that's coming from things like github and things like twitter where 
um, and you know, receiving things like blogging, where suddenly all the voices were there in parallel, and we could each select the ones we wanted and amplify different ones and build build a, a, a parallel structure of, of information, ideas, and products. Um, I think the interesting thing we're going to see is, and we're starting to see the beginnings of this, is this is starting to happen to physical products too, with things like Kickstarter um, and on-demand manufacturing and 3D printing, means that we're going we're, we're gonna to see the, the nichification of physical goods in the way that's happened to the, the virtual goods. That's going to be really exciting over the next few years. Danny Sullivan. Um, I would dearly love to be able to print things I, I swear, I I know. It's, do you know if 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 somebody could make a printer that absolutely positively let me just print what? things so that I don't have to have my kids come upstairs and say oh, I can't print it. It's not printing. It's not working. It's not going on. I just could. Is that so hard to ask? Because it's not going away. And I'm begging you, Google, Apple, Amazon, anybody, just a printer that when I want to print something from my freaking computer it actually prints and works that could be like the number one consumer product that you could do okay i'll pay the inflated in prices if it would just print all right aside from that where are things going to go i wish i knew because <laughs> a millionaire or a billionaire but um i would think that we're going to see our our lives become in more sync it has been an amazing situation to watch how I no longer have to I used to live in Britain right and I would come back here for trips for two weeks and I would like okay I've got to go I'm gonna take my laptop so I gotta take my data with me so I gotta spend an hour making sure I'm copying everything onto something that hopefully <coughs> is big enough to carry all the data that I might possibly need with me as I go I don't even think about it now it's syncing to Google Drive. It's syncing to Microsoft SkyDrive. I, 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 it doesn't matter what computer I take. If sometimes I want to take the Mac Air. Sometimes I want to take the Mac Pro. But it's all there, except for my photos. That's a whole nightmare. The amount of data that we're gathering up with our photos and keeping track of it, there's a whole other thing going on there as to where our next big product area we should be going, trying to find something, all the photo tagging that you might want to do with people's pictures. Hey, I don't kind of want to start that again with, with iPhoto because I already did it with Photoshop Elements and none of that transfers over. So, oh, nightmare situation going on there. But still, the syncing thing has been remarkable. The ability to have our devices, I know the smartphones are getting bigger, but actually smaller because we want to take them, we want them to be portable, but that also leads to the ability to have devices that are adaptable. Where on earth is the thing that I see in that was in, you know, Caprica and all the other sci-fi things where I just do this and it gets bigger, right? You know, I've got this little thing and it's just magic paper air or whatever. Th that we need because I want to be able to take my watch that's on my wrist and then suddenly turn it into a bigger phone or tap it or make all that sort of happen where I have the screen real estate I want in a device that's small enough to be portable. So that would be, that would be nice if we could have that sort of thing. So we have the one device that rules all. The one device that no matter where I go, it can be big, it can be small, and can print. Okay. Thank you for that exhibit. Yeah, that's Kevin. a lot of devices. <laughs> John Borthwick. I was looking for the iPad Mini, so um, hopefully I don't cut out again. So, I mean, I have to pick up on, because I think Kevin and Danny hit some great points. I love the sync stuff, and I th this shit's got to work, right? We've just got to make it work. I mean, it's like I'm sitting here with Skype, and it's going in and out. It's right. And, you know, we blame ourselves as users. We say, oh, my God, it's, you know, I wish it would work for me, or it's my fault. It's like technology has done that to us. Technology has to have to learn how to build things, whether it's, you know, Twitter giving an onboarding experience or whether it's Skype working. It just it's 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 really bad this stuff still doesn't work um and so i think we can improve a lot of stuff in terms of new things i mean there's a lot of stuff which we're which we're doing um that i'm uh obsessively interested in now i mean we've we've done a lot of stuff at betaworks around uh sort of the uh you know how reading writing and sharing evolves um i i'm particularly fascinated and right now there's uh you know some some work which we're doing sort of thinking about how you could slow down and you could actually sort of you know take the incredible you know stream that we've 
uh, or collectively created, uh, and that you can actually drop uh, uh, attention and people's focus down into a fragment of that stream, so they can actually slow down a bit and actually enjoy it and and actually think some. And so it's sort of it's not uh, just it's not putting the brakes on the stream. It's but been finding ways and tools to be able to take the fragments out the stream and then drop people down. Um, into deeper experiences there, and so there's a bunch of things which we're doing around there, and I don't want to plug stuff, so I'm not going to go through products, but there's a bunch of stuff which we're doing um, in that space which I'm interested in. Um, you know, I think that the, um, uh, the it, it's, uh, it, you know, as a product person, it always sounds... Um, it, we've got to we've got to learn how to talk about monetization and or, or monetization. It's like such a shitty word, but just like how you make money off these things. Because I think we've uh, we've overinflated a lot of these companies and overbuilt a lot of these companies based on the expectation, a huge expectation of uh, of revenue. And so you know you you've got Facebook out there now as a public company, and uh, you know it's it's I don't know if you guys have been reading Rich Greenfield's work, but you know I used to follow him. He was an analyst who sort of spent of time uh, writing very thoughtful but also very tough uh, reports about uh, AOL and Time Warner and about the future of media and he's sort of become the uh, you know one of the analysts who's really sunk his teeth into Facebook and trying to understand mobile monetization and how it's evolving and um, and his work is is pretty good I mean he's really trying to he's really looking at the ads carefully and trying to figure out how people are going to use them and uh, it's uh, you know it's it's not clear it's working and so I think there's a lot of work that has to be done there because we've got to figure out how you know the fact that Facebook is touching a billion people is remarkable um, but uh, you know email touches billions and billions of people each uh, each day and yet it doesn't really it's not a big business and so we have to figure out how to make these things uh, real businesses because uh, the I, I think that the potential is there but it's just got to be realized and I think that there's often this temptation uh, to think you know product first product 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 and then business is this thing you slap on later and I actually think the business is something you've got to design into the product workflow as soon as possible and the, the truly remarkable businesses that you see out there are ones where the the monetization uh, moves with the grain of the experience and doesn't move against it or is not just slapped on after it so I think that that's uh, that's important stuff other than that I got to go I got to um, I got to go play with my node um, so which is the future I guess um, and um, you know I uh, so those are some thoughts Steve I want to thank uh, John Borthwick, Danny Sullivan, Keith Tier, and Kevin Marks. I want to thank uh, Rackspace and particularly Rob Legess, without which the show would not be uh, right here, right now. I'd like to thank uh, New Tech and their TriCaster. I want to thank our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for bearing with us while we figure out what it is that we're trying to figure out. Uh, I enjoyed the show. Thank you, Kevin. I don't know what the hell you're showing me. <laughs> EU flag. Union flag. Oh, yeah, okay, the, great. The, um, the Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel Prize winning EU flag. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>